All right. Um, in the next couple of videos, I want to put my focus on just some basics about the immune system and the immune responses and just kind of talk about what immunity is. Um, in this particular video, I'm going to focus on what's called innate immunity or another way to, uh, another word for innate is non-specific immunity. Okay, um, and then we'll, I'll talk about the difference between this and specific immunity in a second. So basically, that's kind of what the next series of videos are going to be about, the immune system, i.e. the defense system. Now, basically, when it comes to levels of immunity, what it really comes down to is how specific are our defenses, all right? Um, and again, there are two major forms of defenses in the body. There is, there are the, there's innate immunity, and then there's what's called specific immunity, or another word for this is adaptive immunity. All right. So basically, when it comes to, um, when it comes to the major differences between these two, um, you know, the, the biggest difference between these with specific immunity, what it comes down to is, you know, is basically recognizing antigens. Okay, remember antigens are unique markers. All right, and these antigens can either be found basically, um, you know, on a cell itself, you know, whether it's a cancer cell, a bacteria, a virus, or sometimes there can be proteins that act as antigens, you know, like a, like a venom of some sort or, um, uh, you know, venoms, allergens or whatnot. Okay, but what it comes down to is on the molecular level, really specifically recognizing a foreign threat to the human body and then engaging in trying to eliminate that threat. Okay, and we'll talk about in another video kind of the systematic process of specific immunity, but that's really how specific immunity works. We recognize a specific antigen, carry out a specific attack, and get rid of that foreign antigen that is invading our body. Um, and that's something to remember about the immune system in general when we're, when we're talking about specific immunity is that the immune system, when, when, we, when it does recognize something as being foreign, whether it is something we recognize that actually literally is foreign or our own tissue, and sometimes our immune system turns on ourselves, and we call that autoimmunity, um, you have to remember one thing. The immune system attacks for the purpose of eradication. Okay, the immune system is trying to get rid of that foreign antigen altogether. And a lot of times it's successful, a lot of times it's not. All right, so that's something to keep in mind about, you know, that is the major difference between these two defense systems. Whereas with innate or nonspecific immunity, basically this just comes around um, basically dealing with anything that, that, that can potentially be wrong. You know, for example, um, we can break our defenses up into three lines of defense and they get more specific as we work our way down these lines of defense. Our first line of defense, you know, you notice the first two lines of defense are going to be, um, you know, non-specific. Okay, the innate immunity, and then the third line of defense is the um, specific immune system, which is I forgot to mention, mediated by T and B cells or T and B lymphocytes. Okay, um, so the first line of defense, essentially, the first. Gosh dang it. The, the first line of defense is basically just our external barriers, which we'll talk about in a second here. But essentially, our external barriers are, I mean, these are just the, your skin and your mucous membranes, to, you know, in a nutshell. All right, these are just physical barriers that, that prevent more than just pathogens from getting in and out of you. They prevent us from losing water and, and so on. Okay, the second line of defense is a little more specific and is designed for attacking purposes, but you know these these range but but these are still kind of general cellular responses that affect our that, that affect our body, but again, it doesn't come down to just recognizing a particular antigen and only attacking that antigen okay and we'll and and also you know these and oftentimes, these um, the second line of defense, uh, not oftentimes, but sometimes, is activated by the third line of defense via antibodies. You know the activity of that, you know, via antibodies and so on. 
Okay, so these, you know, all these tend to work together and in line, but essentially if a pathogen works its way you know beyond our first and second line of defense that's when t and b cells come in through a process called humor humoral and cellular immunity which i'll talk about in another video all right so basically when it comes down to our forms of innate immunity these are the major non-specific um forms of innate immunity we have again the first line would you know and this would be the first line of defense and then all of the rest would be part of that second line of defense okay our external barriers phagocytes interferon fever inflammation and what's called the complement activation system which is uh which is taken care of by what are called complement proteins all right so basically all of these fall within the forms of innate immunity and in this particular video i'm going to cover these ones here i'm going to save inflammation for i could i could just i could spend an entire video talking about inflammation that's a very important concept you need to know and i'm not going to try to jam that i don't want to try to jam that into this one and rush through it and then complement i'm going to wait to talk about when i get to um the specific immunity and, and talking about antibodies because that'll make a little more sense when we talk about how anna you know when you when you understand antibodies a little more and the fact that antibodies are what uh, activate complement proteins so in this particular video we're going to focus on physical barriers phagocytes interferon and fever okay very again you know non-specific forms of immunity so the first line of defense is again as I mentioned before our external barriers essentially would just you know fall down to either or, you know fall within your skin or your mucous membranes okay your skin or your mucous membranes all these are you know external barriers another good way to put these is these are physical barriers okay these are just physical non-specific barriers that are just designed to prevent anything from passing through them okay unless necessary I mean I don't want to say anything but um, but you know it's very difficult for objects to work their way specifically through these membranes okay skin I mean you obviously all know where skin is by now you know skin is that and any you guys you know at this point in time should know what skin is remember skin is that stratified squamous keratinized epithelial tissue all right you know basically the you know basically the you know the epidermis of your skin um well i mean that that's this is the protective part of the skin anyways whereas then you've got the dermis and the hypodermis and um you know the actual physical barrier is the stratified squamous you know keratinized epithelial tissue the epidermis all right and essentially this epidermis um what it you know basically what it is you know this by now it's just a big packed layer you know it's just layers upon layers upon layers of dead and dying cells that pack very tightly together and form a waterproofing physical membrane that prevents water to be it prevents water from just totally leaking out of the skin and prevents pathogens from getting in all right so just the physical presence of the epidermis of the skin is the largest physical barrier of the body all right and then mucous membranes mucous membranes you find in areas where there are oops openings to the outside okay so essentially mucous membranes are, are areas in the body where the ins where the internal aspects of the body are directly exposed to the outside world so where do you think these would be where do you think your mucous membranes would be you know, your nose you know a little bit in your mouth ears with the use of cerumen or earwax um so the I mean, earwax technically is not mucus but we'll just kind of lump it in here um you know your reproductive orifices can you think of anybody can you think of anything else nose mouth ears reproductive area how about the eyes you know the conjunctiva you know conjunctiva so basically there are there's a couple major aspects of these mucous membranes that allow them to be these protective barriers one is this the sheer presence of mucus um, because bear in mind mucus is a very sticky substance and um, you know pathogens could get stuck or trapped in that mucus and then remember the whole point of producing this mucus is to not only get objects stuck in there but to get them out of the body as well and that's where the use of cilia kind of helps us get this material out 
Um, and then there's typically also, and you know, usually anti antimicrobial, antibacterial enzymes and other antimicrobial secretions found within mucous membranes of the body that, that, that help us damage and destroy any kind of pathogens that may be that, that may come in contact with those mucous membranes as well. And then also, you know, another area, you know, like the reproductive tract, for example, the female reproductive system, you know, the, the inner walls of the vagina are very, very acidic. Okay, there's, there's good bacteria that, that thrive in there that, that, that produce a lot of metabolic waste that make that area very, very acidic. Oop, I forgot another one. Anus. Um, you know, essentially, so as a result, uh, you know, so there, you know, so we do have a symbiotic relationship with some of these organisms as well, just like with our skin. We have a lot of bacteria on our skin that are very useful for us, you know, you know, because of their physical presence. All right. You know, the respiratory tract or the conducting airways of the respiratory system are lined with, you know, with the, with, with those mucosal membranes. And, um, you know, again, just like anywhere else, there's mucus, there's enzymes in there. They're designed to act the, to get rid of bacteria. The genitourinary tract, you know, a big part of the defense here is basically the pH of urine. Okay, urine typically is acidic. Okay, urine is typically acidic, but we can influence the pH of our urine based on what we eat, you know, what we drink, how active we are, um, you know, but... But, you know, but the, but the usual um, acidic nature of urine uh, is what tends to clean out the, you know, the walls of the urethra and prevent bacteria from migrating up because that's, a, that's an open doorway for bacteria to migrate up into the urinary system through there. Um, and that's why, for example, you know, if, a, you know, if you're a female, that's why they tell you to drink certain juices. Like, I think they tell you to drink cranberry juice. Um... Yeah, cranberry juice. If you know you get a UTI or you get UTIs on a fairly regular basis, because that'll make your urine more acidic. Okay, or that's why if a person has an indwelling catheter, i.e., a catheter that is left in the urethra for long periods of time, so the bladder is just constantly emptied, a person is at a greater risk for getting a UTI for contracting a UTI. Okay, because one. You know that you know with that with the presence of that catheter within the urethra, that catheter you know one kind of opens up the urethra a lot more. So you just you know made the doorway bigger for bacteria to get in. But instead of the urine coming in contact with the walls of the urethra and washing and basically washing and preventing that bacteria from getting in there, now that urine is coming in contact with a plastic tube. So it's so the chances of bacteria migrating up the urethra into the bladder and creating a UTI are now a lot greater because that acidic urine is not is not cleaning out the urethra like it normally would. Okay, and then the digestive tract. You know, for example, the stomach has a you know the the stomach produces a very strong acid, hydrochloric acid that typically has a pH of around two point five. Um, and, you know, if you eat anything, you know, any foods with bacteria or bacteria get in there, I mean, that's a very hazardous environment for most organisms to grow and thrive in. So the, you know, the, the, the acidity of the stomach is very good at killing pathogens. Um, plus, there are patches within the, within the small intestine, uh, you know, uh, you know, pyrus patches that are helpful for grabbing any bacteria that may leak from the colon into the small intestine and so on. All right, so in general, our, our barriers, you know, these physical barriers do a, a pretty good job of defending us, but they don't always do their job to the full extent. So sometimes organisms do get by these physical barriers, you know, whether it's through natural means or whether it's because we cut ourselves, a person's a smoker, and they're not, pre and they're not uh, cycling through mucus in their airways like they should. If a person is taking you know, prescription antacids, you got to be careful not to eat foods with a lot of bacteria like non-homogenized dairy products and so on because, um, you know, because that acid normally kills those bacteria. So, but so if there's any kind of weakness in these external barriers and the pathogen gets through these, then that's where the secondary barriers come in and, um, or the secondary, uh, the second line of defense comes in. And one of those major second lines of defense is phagocytosis. Okay, basically, um, you know, remember, think of phagocytosis as um, cellular eating. Okay, phagocyte, you know, obviously phagocytosis 
is done is is performed by you know phagocytes. Okay, cells that just basically literally physically consume, you know, and, and you know a, a cellular entity that does not belong and digest it and break it down. All right, so phagocytes basically what they need to do first is they need to distinguish the body cells from you know, let's say for example you get a cut in your skin and bacteria get in. They basically they distinguish uh, you know our cells from bacteria by what are called pathogen associated molecular patterns. Or PAMPs. Okay, so basically, what these are is that they, these are essentially, you know, molecules or molecular patterns that are only produced by microorganisms. Okay, so basically, what they're, well, how phagocytes know the difference between, um, between a bacteria, virus, a viral antigen, whatever it may be, is that it, you know, the, these phagocytes, you know, our immune system tends to know most of the cells of our body by the time we're born okay so when some foreign object does get into our does get into our system um, there are certain patterns or antigens that can be recognized as different from ours you know with the third line of defense T and B cells recognize specific antigens or markers phagocytes just basically notice different molecular patterns in the arrangement of those bacteria and then um, consume them for example uh, bacteria, you know, bacteria. If if we're talking about um, a gram-positive bacteria, there's a certain type of protein. Uh, basically, there's a certain type of protein in gram-positive bacteria called a peptidoglycan. Okay, and what it does is it forms this very, very, very kind of layered uh, scaffolding network and creates this very thick membrane on the on the outside of these gram-negative bacteria, which none of our cells have. Okay, none of our cells have this, all right, or with gram-negative bacteria, there are these liposaccharides that are normally on the surface of these bacteria that are not on our cells. So a phagocyte can tell the difference between, um, you know, between, a, between these bacteria and our own cells, just again, due to the molecular makeup of their, of their, of their membranes, not because they're recognizing a specific antigen. You have to keep that in mind, okay, so you're just looking at structural differences between these between these foreign bacteria or viruses and so on and our own cells okay and phagocytes can be broken down into three major groups or three specific categories um, neutrophils are the first main categories these are basically specifically found located in the blood and migrate into tissues okay and neutrophils tend to be you know a lot of them are stored in bone marrow until we need them um, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Mononuclear phagocyte system, basically what these are, these are just circulating phagocytes, otherwise known as monocytes. And by now, after you've gone through, uh, you know, you, we, you always talk about blood prior to this topic, so you all know what monocytes are. And then there are what are called organ system phagocytes. These are basically phagocytes that have migrated into organs, okay, and they make a home there. Now, bear in mind that um, that these phagocytes are going to look a lot different, uh, you know, in the in the organs themselves than they did in the blood. Okay, you know, these phagocytes tend to adapt to the environments that you find them in. For example, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, dendritic cells. You know, uh, microglia. Kupfer cells, okay, macrophages, these are all phagocytes, okay, they're all phagocytes that are fixated in different tissues of the body. Dendritic cells are phagocytes that are found in the skin. Microglia are, are, are a type of glial cell, which are a phagocyte found in the central nervous system, i.e. the brain. Kupfer cells are phagocytes that are fixated in the liver. Macrophages are phagocytes that tend to be fixated within connective tissues of the body. Okay, even though they, you know, they all circulated in the blood, you know, originally they were all created in bone marrow, circulated in the blood, migrated to the tissues, and then they just hang out here. And then, like I said, they adapt to the environments that they're found in. Okay, 
So that's something you have to bear in mind about these organ-specific phagocytes is that they're going to look different. Or alveolar cells that are found in... Um, you know, that are found in the airways of the lungs. Again, they're going to look a lot different than a dendritic cell found in the skin. All right. So you have to keep that in mind as well when thinking about this. And some of these phagocytes that are found within these organs are fixed. You know, when I say fixed, meaning they are fixated in place. Okay. They are immobile. All right. Um, now, Phagocytes, though, not every phagocyte is immobile, and a lot of these phagocytes basically migrate to areas where there are tissue damage, and a lot of them migrate via the bloodstream, and they do so through a process called chemotaxis. Okay, basically think of this as being attracted to chemicals. Okay, being attracted to chemicals. All right, so let's talk about this for a second, how this works, because this is not only an important concept to understand just about how phagocytes, you know, migrate through the bloodstream and get to tissue. This is very important. If you want to understand inflammation, if you want to understand how white blood cells in general migrate towards specific tissues and then work their way into tissues, this is going to be an important concept for you to understand. All right, so basically, so let's say we've got, oh, I don't know, let's say, here's the skin, and let's say, oh, we, someone got poked in the skin with a nail, had a bad day, okay, and now all of a sudden we've got these bacteria getting into the dermis. So remember, so if we poke a nail completely through the epidermis, now the dermis, the middle layer of skin, is now going to be exposed. All right, is now going to be exposed. Now, so what's going to happen? So we've got these phagocytes in the bloodstream. All right, we got these phagocytes in the bloodstream. They may have been released from bone marrow. They may already have been circulating around in there. But what's going to happen are these damaged tissues are going to, um, are essentially going to release chemical messages. Okay, chemical messages. Whether we're talking damaged cells or whatnot, they're going to release these chemicals that are going to attract these phagocytes to the site of the damage. Okay, and the first phagocytes that are going to work their way over to the area of damage are going to be neutrophils. Okay, remember when we talked about blood, we called neutrophils first responder cells. They're first responder cells. All right. So what's going to happen then are once these neutrophils get to the area of damage, they have to, you know, they have to get from the bloodstream into the tissue. Now, this, now, th now, there's a little problem here because, one, remember that, you know, remember this type of blood vessel here is going to be a capillary uh, racer. You know, this, this type of vessel here is a capillary. And remember, capillaries are porous vessels. All right. And remember, the pores in a capillary are essentially created by the overlapping nature of the endothelial cells that make up the structure of the capillary because remember all capillaries are are their endothelial cells surrounded by you know the thin basement membrane like any other form of epithelial tissue and remember that basement membrane is just nothing more than just a, a gel that allows for the rapid diffusion of material you know across that you know across the membrane itself all right but remember that these pores these spaces in between capillaries are small okay they're very very small so if you've got a, you know, I mean, red blood cells are quite small. Proteins are even smaller, all right? And proteins can barely even fit through these pores in the capillaries. Red blood cells aren't going to be able to fit through here. And white blood cells are much larger than both of these put together. So white blood cells naturally aren't going to be able to just squeeze right through the pores and capillaries. So the problem we face here is how are we going to get white blood cells, you know, let's just stick with neutrophils in this particular situation, from the bloodstream into the skin. All right, so what happens in this area, you know, for starters, you know, again, these chemicals are released, and then what happens, you know, once they get in this, once the, the white blood cells get to this area, they kind of, what they do is they start to roll around. 
and they roll around and they'll eventually come in contact with the walls of the um, of the capillary itself and we call this margination okay when the when the when the neutrophils um, actually stick to the walls of the vessel all right when they stick to the walls of the vessel now typically now again I'm not going to go in depth with this process but we'll talk about it later on in another video Typically, there's going to be cells in the connective tissue spaces near capillaries called mast cells. Okay, called mast cells. And what mast cells are going to do is they're going to release some chemicals that are going to help the, the, the white blood cells out in this process. You know, two of those chemicals, one of them is going to be heparin, and the other one is going to be histamine. Okay, so basically these are like fixated basal fills in the tissues. All right, um, so heparin is an anticoagulant. All right, I'm going to tell you right now, do not say blood thinner. Uh, if, you're, you know, if you're a nursing student listening to this and um, you're about ready to go out in a clinical rotation and you know, someone that, you know, people are going to drill you and quiz you all the time, you know, if they ask you what heparin does, if you say blood thinner, you're going to get your head ripped off. Um, you know, just because one, because, you know, especially if you're interning around nurses, you know, nurses tend to spend a lot of the day, um, you know, getting harped on by doctors and patients and uh, basically getting ordered around all the time. And then they can be quite crabby at times. If you catch them in the right moment when they are really crabby, they'll take it out on you. So make sure you are on top of your game. And when you're asked the question, you give the precise answer. Nothing against nurses. You know, we need you, I love you to death, but sometimes they can, you know, y'all can get kind of crabby. Um, now, um, anti, so basically an anti, when we say anticoagulant, we're, we're talking about preventing the formation of a blood clot. Okay, so essentially, you know, so that'll help just, so that'll make it a little easier for the, um, for the neutrophils to actually get into here without any clots plugging the, plugging the way. And then what histamine is going to do Histamine is going to stimulate these cells, these endothelial cells of the capillary to kind of retract from one another. So let's say here's the endothelial cells normally. What they're going to do then is they're going to kind of pull apart from one another. Oops, that was terrible. What they're going to do is they're going to pull apart from one another, and then now we've got a larger space, and now the, white, and now the, the neutrophils can squeeze into the tissue, all right? And, you know, so they're not going to, I know this looks a little big here, but the white blood cell isn't just going to fit nicely like we walk through a door. What's going to happen is the white blood cell, once it adheres to the, to the wall of this vessel, it's going to stretch itself out, and then what it's going to do is it's going to squeeze itself through the... Um, through the through the, the 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 enhanced pore of the capillary into the tissue space and this squeezing through into the tissue this is called diapedesis diapedesis so the squeezing of this neutrophil into the tissue space itself all right and then now once the neutrophil gets into you know once the neutrophil gets into the, the, the tissue, the damaged tissue itself, then it's going to go to work. Remember, neutrophils are granulocytes. Okay, so what they're, so they're going to, neutrophils are going to do two things. One, they're going to degranulate. They're going to, they're going to open up and they're going to, you know, through exocytosis, they're going to dump out these enzymes that are going to damage, um, that are going to, that are going to be hazardous to the bacteria that are going to be getting into the skin. And they may do some damage to some surrounding cells in the process. All right, and then the other thing that they're going to do is they're going to, phagocytize these bacteria. They're going to eat them and digest them. Okay, and then eventually the, bag, eventually the phagocytes in the tissue are going to die, and then this is, this is the part of inflammation that I don't really want to get into right now, just because, like I said, I want to make a separate video on this, but there's a whole cleanup process that goes into this as well. So that's essentially how phagocytes get into the tissue spaces. They're chemically attracted to the area of damage or infection, and then what they do is they stick, they adhere to the walls of the, of the, of the vessel, um, again, and that's called margination. It is important to, you know, to know these terms. All right, and then, and then the, the, the phagocyte's going to flatten out, one, and then once the pores of the capillary are enhanced, they're going to squeeze
squeeze through via a process called diapedesis. And then once they squeeze into that tissue, then they're going to go to work and start attacking whatever the invader is that is in that, that worked its way into the tissues. All right. And then the process of phagocytosis itself is kind of neat, um, you know, cellular eating. So basically, um, so essentially what's going to happen here, so if we take a look at this phagocyte, you know, this phagocyte is going to be like any other cell. It's going to have a nucleus. All right, it's going to have some endoplasmic reticulum, just like any other cell. And it's going to have mitochondria. But what it's also going to have, they're going to be loaded with these little packets of lysosomes. Okay, remember the, the, the clinical term lice means to break. Okay, it means to break. So essentially what's going to happen then, once this phagocyte comes in contact, let's say here's the bacteria, some bacteria there. So what's going to happen is this phagocyte, once it kind of, in a chemotactic fashion, works its way over to that bacteria, what it's going to do is it's going to create this invagination in the plasma membrane, all right? And then what it's going to do is it's going to engulf those bacteria, all right? It's going to engulf those bacteria. And then eventually what it's going to do is it's going to close this, it's going to, it's going to close itself off, the membrane off around this, and then this is going to actually, you know, and then this, then this is going to be called a phagosome. All right. And then so basically what we have here is we have this little packet full of bacteria now inside of the phagocyte itself. All right. So now, and then this is where the lysosomes come in. The lysosome is then going to fuse with the phagosome, and then it's going to basically release its contents into the phagosome. And again, basically light, remember these are lytic enzymes. All right, these are lytic enzymes. Remember, lytic means to break. So these are enzymes that are going to digest and break apart the bacteria. All right. And then basically the phagocyte, once it's done breaking down the once it's done breaking down the um, bacteria, then what it's going to do is via exocytosis you know, get rid of the remains and then we're good to go. Sometimes they may take proteins or antigens that they consume and present them on their on on the on the surfaces of themselves and act as what are called APCs or antigen presenting cells, which is a very important part of uh, initiating and enhancing the specific immunity, the third line of defense that we talked about. So, but I'm not going to get in depth with that right now because that's a again that's just a process for. Um, another time or for another video. Okay, so that's essentially the role that phagocytes play in the in the innate immunity. Next what I want to talk about is a is a defense called interferon. Okay, interferon. What interferon is, it's basically interferon is used to a fight against a virus. Okay, they're they're used to fight against a virus. So basically, what they're designed to do is is prevent a you know prevent non-infected cells from getting infected. Okay, and you know and one thing that's interesting about interferon is that not terribly long ago the FDA actually approved the use of interferon in fighting certain forms of cancer and viral infections and diseases and so on. Okay, well, like I said, interferon is primarily a defense against viruses. Okay, so let's talk about viruses for a second here and how they work. Now, there are, there are basically two major categories of viruses. There are either DNA-based viruses or there are RNA-based viruses, otherwise known as retro viruses, okay, retroviruses. But basically the whole point, whether we're talking about a DNA or an RNA based virus, you know, you know, you have to remember one thing about viruses is they are parasites. They're parasites. Okay. Can't spell today. Um all right, and you know, like any other parasite, whether it's a molecular parasite or it's a leech or any other kind of animal, parasites need a host. Parasites need a host in order to survive. Okay, 
and um, and without that host, they're not going to live. All right, that's why you know parasites they 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 thrive off of other organisms and the well-being of other organisms at that. All right, so but now we're talking about a molecular parasite here. Now remember the one sole function of a cell. Remember the purpose of cells are to manufacture proteins. Okay, cells are just protein factories. That's all they are. All right, they make proteins so they can sustain their own lives. They make proteins to, um, you know, to allow other cells to function. But I, that's that's all they're doing is if it, when you again when you break down the real functionality of the organelles of a cell, it revolves around turning out proteins. Okay, now what a virus is going to do then? So you're probably starting to get the picture then by you know when you when you're looking at either DNA or RNA. All right. The basically what the basically what this revolves around, whether it's using DNA or RNA, is integrating the genetic material of that virus into the host cell. All right. So essentially, what a virus is going to do is so let's say here's the host cell, and then here's the virus. All right. If this is a DNA-based virus, say nucleus. All right. If this is a DNA-based virus. It's going to basically attach to that cell. It's going to insert its DNA into that cell, and that DNA is going to work its way into the nucleus. And then that, and then that viral DNA is basically going to is going to more or less take over the, the regular DNA of that cell. It's going to integrate itself within the genome of that cell. All right, and then basically, you know, so basically now you have a viral genome in control of the activity of that cell. So basically, what that what what that what that's going to stimulate then is instead of instead of using transcription and translation to turn out messenger RNA for the purpose of creating normal cellular proteins, now you're going to create messenger RNA for the purpose of creating viral proteins. Okay, so essentially what 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 this virus is doing is it's tricking the cell to manufacture viral proteins for the purpose of essentially manufacturing more viruses. Okay, and then if we're talking about a retrovirus or an RNA-based virus, these tend to be a little, little different. Um, basically, so let's say here's that virus. What they're going to do is they're going to contain RNA, and then they're going to contain an enzyme as well called reverse, reverse transcriptase. All right, so essentially what this is going to do is it's going to insert this RNA into the in, into the host cell, and then reverse transcriptase is essentially going to go backwards along this strand of of RNA, and it's going to stimulate the production of basically viral DNA. And then just like what we talked about over here, that viral DNA is going to integrate with the host cell's DNA, and all and then basically it's going to uh, you know basically alter its genome. And stimulate the cell to produce more retroviruses. That's basically what cells do: is they take over the nucleus of the cell, and then they, and then you know, what you know of as the control center of the cell by now, and then that stimulates the the cell then to manufacture new viruses. Okay, and then essentially what's going to happen as these viruses are manufactured, they're going to start to kind of you know bubble up in the plasma membrane, and they're going to start to bud out, and then they're going to go and infect other cells. All right, they're going to go out and they're going to infect other cells. And eventually, the cell that was infected by the virus is going to die. Okay, because if the cell is not manufacturing proteins for itself, it is eventually going to die. And then what's going to happen is the cell is just going to, you know, break open. And then these viruses are then going to, you know, escape and then just go continue to infect other cells in the area. All right. So what interferon does, so when when some cells are infected by a virus before they're too far gone, they are going to release a protein called interferon. Okay, and essentially interferon is think of interferon as like a warning signal, you know, like a smoke signal or whatever, I don't know, however you want to think of it. Okay, interferon is a signal that essentially is going to stimulate these cells to, you know, up their antiviral defense. 
their antiviral defenses. Okay, it may not work completely, but it's gonna. Well, what it's going to do is it's going to slow down the viral infection. The harder it is for a virus to infect another cell, the harder it is to generate more viruses and and continue to grow and spread the infection. And then that will basically, you know, if we can slow that down, that process down through the use of interferon. That makes it easier for our specific immunity, our T and B cells, to come in and take care of business. And you have to bear in mind that when when the immune response does actually happen, um, you know we're not only going to attack and destroy these viruses, we're also going to attack and destroy these virally infected cells as well. All right. So that's basically what interferon is and how viruses work. Um, the last thing I want to talk about in, in, in regard to innate immunity is a fever. All right, is a fever. Fevers are natural responses to infections, and they are important. You know, you, know, you only hear about fever and inflammation when people talk about how much or how little fun they are to go through. And it's understandable because I'm assuming every single one of you that's listening to this has had a fever at some point in time and know that they're just not pleasant experiences to go through. And, um, but at the same time, they are important because they do help us fight the infection. Fevers just get to be dangerous when they get to be too out of control and they, or if they don't go away. All right. So natural responses to infections. Now, basically, what the, what this revolves around is basically increasing our normal core body temperature. You know, ninety eight of ninety eight point six degrees Fahrenheit or thirty seven degrees Celsius. Okay, Re elevating that temperature up a couple of degrees. All right, and fevers tend to have three stages, which I'll talk about in a second here, and. Um, you know, the onset of the plateau and the defervescence phases of a fever. Okay. Now, fevers, basically, the, 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 the positive sides of fevers is, one, they increase the activity of neutrophils. They increase, should have put metabolic activity there, sorry. They increase metabolic activity. And, you know, by increasing metabolic activity, that's going to increase healing and uh, repair of any damage that's taken place to our tissues. And you have to bear in mind that's going to create a hazardous environment for pathogens in general. Okay, by creating this hazardous environment for pathogens, you know, you have to remember, especially with bacteria, all right, um, you know, bacteria, like any other cell, are finicky about the environments that they need to grow and thrive in. And by increasing or decreasing the temperatures, even if it's only by a couple of degrees, can, you know, probably won't kill them, but it can prevent them from spreading or slow them down. Okay, so that's the nice thing about elevating the body temperature, but like I said, it just never feels good to go through a fever. But as mentioned before, you know, by elevating their body temperature, though, that can cause um, complications with the body. You know, it's going to, you know, it, it, they could cause, you know, it, the biggest effects you're going to see are going to be on the central nervous system and the neurons. All right, you know, because neurons, if one body temperature gets too high and uh, neurons start firing in an asynchronous, uncoordinated fashion, that could cause people to have seizures, which you see a lot more in kids than adults. Um, you know, and it's just, and, and, you know, neurons, like any other cell, are, you know, they need optimal environments. They're just a lot more finicky than most other cells. And eventually, they're just going to start to shut down. And, well, you can do the math on what happens when your central nervous system shuts down. Um, so fevers are good, but they can be bad if they're too extreme. So let's just kind of talk about how this how this process works. So basically, when you when you get an infection, um, basically throughout in, in the midst of this infection, there are chemical messages called pyrogens. Oops, pyrogens that are going to be secreted. You know what py? You guys all know what pyro means. That's fire. Okay, it's Greek for fire. All right, so basically these pyrogens, what they're going to do is they're going to go to the hypothalamus. All right, so let's say we've got the infection here. And then let's say this is your body temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, bear in mind I'm in the United States, so I'm going off of the Fahrenheit system here. Um, or I'll just put this on here, 37 degrees Celsius. For my, for my worldwide listeners. 
Okay, so you have the you have the initial infection. These pyrogens are secreted, and what they're going to do is they're going to go to the hypothalamus. And basically, you know, without getting into too much detail, what they're going to do is they're going to stimulate the hypothalamus to basically elevate your core, your normal core body temperature from 98.6 degrees up. Okay, so they're gonna they're gonna bring the temperature elevated up. That made sense. So they're, they're going to it's gonna stimulate the hypothalamus to increase um, our normal set body temperature. So normally you'd be at, you know, let's say it's 90.6 degrees. Now you're going to go up. Okay. And then what you're going, and that would be the onset of the fever. Okay. And then as long as the infection is present, you, as long as the infection is present, these pyrogens are going to continue to be secreted while you're fighting off this infection, hence the plateau phase. Okay. And then when that infection is gone, then that's when the defervescence phase comes in, and then the body temperature returns back to normal due to the drop in pyrogen secretion. Okay, now this is why when you initially get a fever, that you tend to get you get the chill. You know, the first thing you feel is the chills. You know, I remember the the, the worst fever I ever had was 104.9, 104.9 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, not a fun night. I remember I was working in a grocery store at the time, and I was in high school. And um, and I, I just remember I, it was a uh, late spring, so it was pretty warm. And I was stocking the shelves, and all of a sudden, it just it just literally hit me out of nowhere. I was freezing cold, you know. And I'm normally a person who I, I I don't function well in the summertime, just because I'm always always hot. And you know, so the colder months of the year are my months of the year. Um, but I just all of a sudden just got just got the chills really bad. So I went on the back, grabbed a jacket, put it back on, started working again. Well, the reason why I got the chills was because these pyrogens got to my brain, and then what happened was the hypothalamus, my normal set point, my normal body temperature, was elevated from 98.6 up. Okay, so now let's say it got elevated to, let's say these chemicals stimulated my body temperature to be 100.6 degrees. Well, now I was two degrees cooler than I should have been. So you guys know what it feels like when you're when you when you start to get cold, you're gonna get cold. So your brain literally is saying you're cold now. Okay. So then you're gonna undergo the uh, you're gonna undergo the physiologic responses of when you're cold. You're gonna shiver. You know, you get cold. You kind of get the chills, and then and then you're you're gonna pump out some thyroid hormone and uh, and so on. And then what's gonna happen is your body temperature is eventually gonna go up. Okay. But now all of a sudden your body temperature is 100 degrees. Okay, well, that's higher than we're pretty much accustomed to. So then, all of a sudden, you know, you're going to go from you know, from the chills to holy mackerel. I'm a hundred. I'm a hundred degrees. Okay, and then that's where you're going to start to sweat. You know, that's where. And then you go through these hot, cold phases. Well, now you're sweating, and I mean, when you have a fever, it's typically not a minor sweat. You sweat. I mean, you you have some quality sweat going on there. And then you sweat, you have all this water on your skin, it's going to make you cold, and then you lose all this water and all this heat, and all of a sudden you get chilly again. And then you have to, you know, go through the shivering and the chills again, and then your body temperature finally gets up to 100 degrees, and then you're going to be cooking hot again. And you just keep going through this until the, until the infection is gone. All right. And then once the infection is gone and the pyrogens, you know, the, the secretion of these chemicals go down, then... Basically, your hypothalamus brings your normal body temperature back to 98.6 degrees. All right, or 37 degrees Celsius. All right, and then you know some, you know some. Oftentimes, I get you know I you know I get asked or I hear people talk about this sometimes. You know, is it a good idea to take medications to um, keep a fever down? And you know, you get mixed reviews on this. Uh, some people say it's a good idea. Some people they won't. I'm the kind of person who, I mean, if, if I don't have to go to the hospital over it, uh, let it ride its course. You know, this is a natural physiologic response, and bringing a fever down may not be that good. Okay, you know, I mean, it, it, there are cases where it is necessary to bring a fever down. Once the body temperature starts to get up around, you know, once, once we start getting up into the 105s, 106s, and so on, that's when, the, that's when you're going to start to see delirium set in on a patient. And once you start getting into the, uh, you know, up towards the, you know, the, the, the 110s and so on, the person is going to be close to death. Okay, so when a per when a fever does get too high, and this is going to vary from person to person, depending on, depending on how high their metabolisms are, um, how intense this you know how intense this 
pyrogen secretion activities going on, how the hypothalamus is going to respond to this, um, uh, how severe the infection is. All right, but you know, if the body temperature does start getting that high, then the person is going to have to be cooled off. And that's why, you know, if you're in a, you know, if you're an emer if you're going to work in the emergency room, that's when you're going to dunk a person in an ice bath or put some uh, ice bags around them or something to get the body temperature down to prevent the brain from shutting down and prevent them from having seizures. All right. So me personally, uh, when I get a fever, I just ride it out, and you know, I just go with the old school medicine of uh, whiskey. Uh, you know, they, you know, uh, grandparents knew best with that. You know, they the. Uh, I mean, they, and when you're, you know, when you're younger, remember a grandparent uh, giving you a, a little pinch of whiskey or brandy, or they'd mix it with some sugar just to sweeten it up, because you know, when it, you're a kid, that's kind of a hard taste to handle. And then basically, it does the same thing Nyquil does. It just knocks you clean out, and you sleep through it. You know, plain and simple. That's that's a. Uh, I don't know. That's that's the Aaron remedy that I you know. That's my remedy. So that's the reason why that stuff was called medicine a long time ago. Um, yeah. So that basically is my presentation right now of innate immunity. As I mentioned before, I, I'd, I'd like to just do another a whole a whole another video on inflammation and um, save the complement system for when we uh, go cover antibodies and so on. So that is innate immunity. Uh, well, not all of it, but most of it in a nutshell. If you have any questions, you know, don't hesitate to contact me and uh, keep on keeping on. Keep working hard.